My name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. Hey, and I'm Sarah Jaffe. I'm an associate editor at alternet.org, and I've been covering Occupy Wall Street since almost the beginning. Yeah, very cool. I was going to ask you, actually, when was the first time that you remember hearing about it, and then when was the first time you went down there? So I knew it was in the planning stages for a little while. There were some people that I knew who had been doing um, U.S. Uncut that oh, were right. involved. Um, and I would, but I was not, I never went to any early meetings or anything like that. I just sort of, um, I was a little cynical about it. I was like, why are you guys occupying Wall Street on a Saturday? Right. There's me working on Wall Street on a Saturday. And, you know, and they stayed. They stayed one night, they stayed two nights. And by the time I got a minute to go down and look, it was Thursday, it was day five. And I walk down there, and there's a kitchen, and there's a medic table, and there's a sign for a child care center. And I'm like, okay, they're doing something different here. Right. And that was, you know, really what changed my mind about it. And since then, it's just been, I mean, we all know, right? It's been right. Going. Right. It's been amazing. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, I think David Graeber just said something about the fact that it was not very well planned. I mean, it was yeah. kind of very thrown together. And like you said, it was on a Saturday and they didn't get onto Wall Street right away, which they right. wanted to. They got moved to Zuccotti, which turned out right. to be good, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, but, and I had the same, I had the same kind of um, reaction at the beginning. And, and I actually, I saw you on Tom Hartman say that, you know, I was really <laughs> cynical about it. Yeah. And, and I like that because a lot of people, I think, kind of, uh, I don't know, bolstered their creds a little bit after the fact that weren't really involved with it. Um, but I had the, I had the same reaction, which was, I mean, I heard about it early on and, and actually, and you probably also heard at the same time about the, um, October 2011 campaign that was going on that seemed yeah. a lot better planned, I think. Um, but I don't think it's had nearly, well, I mean, it's kind of gotten merged into this movement in a sense. I mean, I think you you mean the the rebuild the dream. Or, well, no, there's a there's a separate October 2012 or 2011 yeah. thing in DC that oh, yeah. they yeah. have a separate occupation even from right. the Occupy yeah. DC, but yeah. they've kind of been merged. I think it's it's like a stop the machine is maybe the name of their yeah. I believe yeah. the stop the machine is um, if I have my facts correct, I might be crazy. Um, is David Swanson and people who are mostly coming out of the anti war movement? Yes. And I mean, the thing that that is interesting to see those merge is that we're realizing that the war is an economic justice issue, right. that economic justice is something that the same people who have been fighting the war should be concerned about. And it's really um, Tom Englehart wrote a really great piece um, of Tom Dispatch about how he came from the 60s. He came from that movement. But back then, economic justice really wasn't on their mind because they were doing pretty well. Right. Uh, we still had a welfare state back then. Right. Um, and, you know, and so they were fighting the war, but they were fighting a lot of abstractions. And right now, these are people who are fighting for their lives. Right. Literally, in some cases, the, you know, the fact that there are homeless people sleeping in these camps is not them being opportunists. It's people realizing we're all in this together, and we're not that far away from being completely out of money, space, time. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I mean, and I think that there is a broad recognition that not just the anti-war movement is an economic justice uh, issue, but really everything is an economic justice issue, right? Yes. With this kind of yeah. inequality, we completely lose control of our government. And so, yeah. you know, everything is out the window. Um, and that's a big deal, I, th I think, on the left, given... Uh, then in the 60s, there was this turn away from labor, from, uh, yeah. you know, so-called bread and butter economic issues to have a movement on the left that's now focused really broadly um, all of these various strains onto an economic justice movement, yeah. I, I think, has huge promise, obviously, you know, yeah. um, so and, and I think probably explains some of its success. So you've been working um, some on You've written some on student loans yes, and um, talked about a campaign to um, 
basically a debt strike to quit paying yeah. for people to quit paying debts. So I'm really intrigued about that. Maybe you could tell everybody about that. So the first time it's been in sort of the air for a while. People have been talking about it. Um, and I was sitting down with a friend, um, my consul who is quoted in my piece, um, talking about, you know, what's, what's going on, what's next, what can we do to fight back? And I sort of was like debt strikes and it just came out of my mouth. And then I was like, Hmm, that's, that obviously wasn't me. You know, that was obviously something that I had read somewhere and that was floating around being discussed. And so, um, then I went to contact con and happened to hear this gentleman stand up and say, I want to make an app or a platform that would help people organize death strikes. And I was like, well, I'm going to go listen to them. And so I did sat in on their planning session. Um, and it was, yeah, from the first initial group, there were eight to 10, maybe 12 people. Um, it ended up being one of the, um, the issues that people wanted to move forward with out of the whole conference. Mm -hmm. And so they're still working on making some sort of a web platform where you could basically self-organize um, the way, I mean, I'm not a developer or a designer, I'm a reporter. So, but the, in my head, it's sort of like how my Barack Obama.com allowed you to organize in your neighborhood, right. um, pull together things yourself, but also, um, have a way to bring everybody together nationally. Um, and I think the fact that it came out of a tech conference in a way is, is really interesting um, because I think there's a lot going on with the connection of Anonymous and the other um, hacktivism groups with Occupy Wall Street. I think that there's, you know, that it's very, very possible to overstate the importance of the internet in this movement because, I mean, the obvious thing that is different here is that people are camping out in the streets, right. bodies in the streets, bodies on the line between, you know, I was watching the Occupy Oakland live stream this morning, but there's also the technology. I'm talking to you. I was watching uh, somebody live streaming this morning. I was watching my, my colleague, Josh Holland and my friend, Susie Cagle tweeting from Oakland this morning. Right. Um, all of these things are playing into each other in really interesting ways. And so the fact that it was a bunch of, of tech activists who wanted to talk about death strikes was, you know, was fascinating to me. And it's a hard thing, particularly student debt, because the government backs it up. Um, right. Like Mike said, the, the bailout is built into the system for student debt. You, they can, they can come after your social security. They can come after your wages. They will basically, there's no way around it. So it's not the same as your credit card company may eventually write down or write off what you owe, um, or you can declare bankruptcy and have it all wiped and it wipes your credit for seven years, but at least the debts are gone. Right. You can't do that with student debt. Right. And so, Which means they probably almost never write it down because right. there's just right. no it's escape just, valve. No yeah. Um, right. I think David Graeber's book in my piece where he says, um, if there's, there's no way but basically into the system of debt, there is built the idea that some people will default, that you won't always get it back, that there's some risk. Right. And if there's no risk, then there's no reason not to give bad debt. We saw this with the housing bubble, right? right? Where they assumed that the value of houses would always go up. So there was no risk that these people would default because they would just be able to refinance. They would be able to do something. Right. The assumption that you would always get your money back leads people to make stupid loans. Right. So we right. have a and the, yeah, and in this case, the government enforces you always getting your money back. So the government is actually, you know, guilty of helping write student, stupid loans to lots of students. Right. Uh, and, and what does the new Obama plan do with respect to student debt? So does... the new Obama plan doesn't write down principle, mm -hmm. which is really important right now, because again, we're talking about, I mean, student debt, private loans, you can get some vicious interest rates, but really... What we're talking about is is kids are basically underwater on their loan, right? They bought a product with the idea that you would get a job. The product right. being four years of education, but the or idea more. you would right four eight, yeah. But right, the idea being that at the end of that you'd get a job, mm -hmm. and that that job would enable you to pay back the loan, right? But and hopefully you know, live, <laughs> right? Exactly. Right. Now you're not able to get a job, pay back the loan, make a living, you're stuck. 11% right. of student loans are in default right now. Right. That's 
you know, and again, there's no, there's no wiping that clean. There's just, those people are going to be suffering for a long time because of it. Right. So yeah, the, the connections and the, the differences from the housing bubble are really interesting to me. Right. Right. So, okay. So, and so the Obama plan doesn't write down principle. Okay. Yeah, but, okay. So it doesn't write down principle. Um, it will limit your payments to a certain percentage of your income. Okay. But only for people, I believe, who are in college right now. It does nothing oh. for me. It does nothing for my friend who has, you know, 80 grand in student debt. Right. It does nothing for people who, you know, just finished last year in the peak of, you know, high unemployment, recession. They're, right. they're not calling it a recession. We're supposedly in recovery, but we know that. Right. 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 We know. Right. We know what it's like to actually be trying to make a living right now. Right. Um, yeah, so it's a Band-Aid and it's a campaign tool. It is, we're doing something about this. Look, Mitt Romney's not going to do anything about this, which, by the way, is true. Mitt Romney's not going to help you at all. Right. But it's a Band-Aid. The same with their foreclosure modification, um, their latest attempt on that. It's it's a Band-Aid. It's really not what's needed, which is some write-down of principle, right. some understanding that the market value of these things is not what they were said to be. Right. Right. And it... Right. And most of the people I've talked to with respect to the housing market, and I've been a little bit disappointed. I've talked to a lot of economic people about um, the, you know, the general short-term crisis, which is considered to be very impacted by the debt levels. And yet yeah. very few economists, you know, there's been a lot of talk about mortgage restructuring, but very little talk really about student debt in yeah. terms of helping the economy. Um, so I've been a little bit... Uh, disappointed with that. I mean, I feel like, I mean, I think it's almost to a trillion dollars now, isn't it? It Student is over a trillion dollars now. Right. Um, yeah. And think about that. Think about my friend Colleen, who has to pay a giant chunk of her income in student debt every month. What else could she be spending that money on? Right. I mean, we're in a demand driven recession. Right. Which is, right. Right. Exactly. So if I, I mean, I, my student debt payments, are a hundred and some odd a month. Right. That's not. Right. That's pretty good. Bad. But yeah, there are people out there who are paying eleven and twelve hundred dollars a month. Right. A mortgage. And they're making, you know, two thousand a month. Right. You know, paying a giant chunk of your income that you could otherwise be spending on other things. You could be spending on travel. You could be spending at your neighborhood restaurant. You could be spending on a new car. You could be right. spending on something that would actually stimulate the economy, as opposed to servicing your debt. Right. As opposed to contributing to essentially the same big banks that caused the housing crisis and mm -hmm. everything else. Right. Um, you know, we're not, we're not helping this by paying our student debt. And one of the questions about debt strikes was, do people put their money in escrow as a show of good faith or did they just say, screw it and go spend it instead because that would actually be what the economy needs. Right. Um, there's a lot of questions about debt strikes, obviously, that I don't think have been answered yet that we're, you know, that's why I wanted to talk to a bunch of people to see essentially what the questions were that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's, there's just. So I mean, it's, st it's still really in the planning phase then the debt strike I mean, idea. I, not even. There's yeah, yeah I mean, nobody it's, started it's being had about tactics. It's not, um, I don't know anybody other than the people who are developing the app who are actually planning a big large scale debt strike right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what I was going to say is think about, personal debt, right? Credit was a substitute for real wage increases for about my entire lifetime, about 30 years, right? right? We have not seen wage increases. We have seen people instead living off of credit, living off of home equity, living off of credit cards. Right. Um, I got into an argument with a friend of mine the other day because she was like, well, just don't charge stuff. And I'm like, sweetie, I got into 10 grand in credit card debt right out of college because I didn't get a job. Right. Because I ended up waiting tables. I had two jobs waiting tables, actually. And right. I still couldn't pay my rent. And so all of my money went to rent, and everything else was going on credit cards. I was buying groceries on credit cards. Right. right. Um, you know, this is this has actually been a problem for quite a while. And then we saw this when uh, the credit markets froze up right after the, the first financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you can't get credit. What do you do? You, you don't have wages, and now they're even going down. Median wage is, what, 26000 now? And that's not counting people who are unemployed. It would be lower if we were counting people who are making nothing. Right, right. So. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and so what is the preferred, um, or I guess, what are some of 
Yeah, yeah. What is the preferred policy for people who are student loan advocates? Uh, for for people who are in the mortgage, um, I would say of the people I've talked to, um, the most usual thing is to modify the bankruptcy rules because, and which could, the same could happen also for student loans, just because mm -hmm. there's already a mechanism there, right? Yeah. So with student loans, there's a hardship exemption, and that could, if that were removed, then then there could be reduction of principal, there could be a discharge of debt, etc. Um, but but both student loans and mortgages have are have specific rules in the bankruptcy courts that really keep us from dealing with that kind of debt. Right. So well, this is the thing too with mortgages, right? The mortgage, the housing bubble could pop, right? Mm -hmm. Housing house values dropped, or house right. prices rather dropped. That's a value is an entirely separate discussion. Um, house prices fell. You are not going to pay what you would for that house this year, what you would have five years ago. Um, your education, meanwhile, just keeps going up every year, um, sometimes by double digit percentages. Um, right. That is not changing. There's no, I mean, that's going to have to be tackled. Um, we need some serious investment in public education in this country, which we're not likely to see anytime soon. Um, no matter which person gets elected president, certainly not any of the Republicans, but probably not from Obama either. Um, you know, we need to tackle the fact that these the the education that is that you are told you need to have is just getting more expensive, and at the same time, we're taking away people's ability to pay for it, um, and we're making those loans more frightening to people to take on. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at you want to go to college. Your parents have no money to help you. You have no savings, but you want to go to college. You get into your state university. So your tuition is seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a year. It's textbooks on top of that, living on top of that. You have a job. You're going to be crunched for time trying to do your schoolwork. You go to school part time. There are different, um, you know, there's just everywhere down the line the system is broken. Right. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's working exactly how we want it to be. Right. Uh, there's always that question, right? Do we really, are we just doing this in order to try to force more people not to go to college? Right. Um, what's going on? But in the meantime, it's having the unintended consequence of screwing the economy because thousands and thousands and thousands of young people are spending more money paying on their, paying toward their student loans than they are on day-to-day -day living expenses, on the little things that we count on people to be able to buy in order to have a consumer spending driven economy. Right. Right. So I, I live in a college town and mm -hmm. so, and we have an occupation here. So student debt is a pretty serious issue yeah. um, in, in our occupation. I also get the sense that it is in New York. Is that true? Is that a pretty common yes. issue? Yeah. I think okay. it's a pretty common issue everywhere because I mean, Unemployment for young people is basically double what it is for the next, you know, it's it's ridiculously high. Right. Who's going to be the ones sleeping in the park? It's mostly younger people. It's mostly kids who are out of right. school. I mean, that's not entirely true. There are plenty of people who are not, you know, 22 years old who are sleeping in parks, who are taking part in these occupations, who are working really hard on them. Right. But... In large part, these are being driven by young people. Right? Chris Hayes had a really great segment on his show yesterday talking about the generational um, aspects of what's going on here, the Occupy versus the Tea Party, and the spending that we do as a, as a, a nation on the elderly versus the young. Um, and right. also statistics, which is always interesting. Um, but yeah, so I think student debt is a huge issue for these for nationwide because yeah, that's, you know, you, you can tell who's hurting, right? Right. Every, everyone's hurting. That's not fair. But the, yeah, the people who are going to be willing to sleep out in a park to camp out this long are going to be people who are young, people who are unemployed, and people right. who usually are fighting to pay back something. Right. Yeah, we actually, it's surprising, we actually don't have as much support as I would think you would from people who are actually in school. The people we have are people who are just out of school. Well, you know. And have the huge debt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. when I, okay, I was in grad, I got out of grad school in 2009 and I was teaching. 
Um, and I, I was, you know, teaching the journalism program. I was not teaching about the economy, but I would see kids and you would talk to them, the ones who were undergrads. And I, you know, I finished undergrad in 2002. And like I said, I got into 10 grand credit card debt because I was working two jobs, waiting tables and couldn't pay my bills. I knew what it was like to get out of school and not be able to find a job and to have student debt to pay off. And when I went back to school and I would try to talk to some of these kids about what are your options, what are your plans, what are you going to do, mm-hmm. they, most of them were very convinced that they were going to go get a job. Most of them working in journalism, which, the, you know, anybody yes. who's paying attention to journalism knows that, like, I'm really lucky to have a job. I was laid off in May, and I was really, really lucky to find a job, even more lucky to find a job that I actually like. Um, and, the, yeah, the kids who are in school – haven't had that institution fail on them yet. Right. They're not being faced with what it's actually like. They think, because this is the American story, right, that if you work hard, you'll right. get a job and you'll be fine. Right. And yeah. The kids who are out who are suddenly realizing, oh, man, my graduating with honors and, and my, you know, 20 grand in loans, this didn't get me anything. Right. Those are the people who are realizing – if this is if this institution is failing, if the university failed me, what else is failing? Right, right. So to return to kind of some bigger uh, questions about Occupy Wall Street. So I wanted to get your, you know, I I think I get a sense that kind of the demands issue has uh, been resolved. I think everybody decided that that not making demands at this time was a good idea. Do you have that sense? It seems to be. I think the demands working group here is still doing their thing, but I think, yeah, I, it does seem to me that that has sort of been decided in favor of, no, we don't make demands. We're not taking hostages, I think someone said, which I thought was great. Right. Um, yeah, I think, like I, I was saying about institutional failure, mm-hmm. we've realized that the we're not asking from, for the people above us to do something anymore. We've lost faith in their ability or their desire to do so. Right. So we're doing it ourselves. Um, that's the vibe anyway. I mean, when you look at building a, a health care tent in right. Zuccotti Park where there are doctors and nurses, and my friend walked in there to do an interview the other day and somebody was getting acupuncture. Right. And we're, we're building rather than we, I shouldn't say we, I'm, you know, I'm not down there. I'm not living down there that much uh, or at all. Um, but I am watching it happen. Mm-hmm. It's we're it's people doing it themselves. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's little a anarchism. I think uh, David Graeber said, which I think is true. It's it's forget the state. We're doing this. We're not asking for permission. We're just doing it. Right. And these face downs with the police, like we saw again in Oakland this morning. Right. Yeah. I didn't see the last the last on that. I'm going to close my curtain really fast. I didn't see the I didn't see the last on that. What ended up happening? Um. Basically, looked like there was not much violence. There were some arrests, and they tore down the camp again. And the, the last I saw before I turned the live stream off to talk to you was that they were saying they were going to regroup at four o'clock at the library. Okay. Um. And so I assume that that's what they'll do. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just they will just keep coming back because. Right. Where else yeah. are they going to go, right? Right. And also, again, it's just the – it's it's removal of consent from the authority, you know, mm-hmm. saying we don't, we don't endorse your power over us anymore. We are right. going to keep doing this no matter what you say. We are going to keep facing you down. You can arrest us. We will come back. Right. And that's really powerful. And I think I was saying to someone the other day – that the moment that really, really did it for people was the Brooklyn Bridge. They arrested 700 people on the Brooklyn Bridge. And they just came back. They just kept coming back because you realize that it wasn't that scary. And when you arrest 700 people, when you get arrested with 20 of your best friends, man, that's not that scary. Right. You know, scary is if you're a kid in the Bronx or Harlem and you were stopped and frisked for no good reason and you were thrown in jail by you know, by yourself. And this is, that's scary. Being arrested in a giant group of people is a lot less scary. And right. And then is, coming back to cheering crowds and. Exactly. Coming back to support, you know, every right. time 
it's basically it's teaching people that this isn't that bad. My friend Susie, who's been covering Oakland, has been tear gassed twice mm-hmm. and arrested, and mm-hmm. she was out there this morning because right. that's just it's just not that bad once you've lived through it. Right, right. Were and you there? So were you there for the Brooklyn Bridge? Were you? I, I, on the, I was not arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge. I didn't make it on the Brooklyn Bridge. I was there that day and went on the march. Um, several of my friends wound up on the bridge sort of scrambling out right. the street in order to not be arrested. Right. And um, one of my coworkers was arrested. Um, Kristen Gwynn was arrested that night. And again, the right. story is, you know, it just wasn't that scary. The cops weren't that bad to us. They took us to jail, but we were all in there together. It right. wasn't that bad. Susie's right. story was a little worse, but uh, she's still back there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so, and I kind of forgotten that there is a demands working group going on. So yeah. that is, that is there. They, they are there. They, they don't seem to have gotten very good response from the rest of the occupation. Okay. So, so that's just, they're, go, they've formed their group and they're working through whatever proposals they intend to make. Right. And that's just where it is. Yeah, they, they exist. It's a group. It's a working group yeah. that exists. We don't know how much work they're actually doing. I'm not sure how much work they're actually doing. Um, that's the question, right? How much work yeah. are the groups doing? It's, it, basically, it basically seems to have disappeared to me. It seems like it was kind of a big deal for a while, and then everybody, yeah. I think, kind of came to almost a complete consensus. It sounds like not quite, but yeah. kind of a consensus yeah. that it was the right thing to do, not to make demands, yeah. at least at this stage. Um and so, and and I guess, and I think there is, I can hear it from you, there is kind of um, a division on whether to interact with the political system at all at some point, right? Of whether this is just something that is, you know, the park is the goal. It's kind of something that you'll hear occasionally. Yeah. I think that some people will obviously do their own thing when it comes to the political system. Um, there have been some solidarity actions in New York with um, a couple of groups that have been working around the millionaires tax. Uh-huh. Um, there are definitely things that are connected and springing out of the occupation that are working for one or another political goal. Um, uh-huh. But, and I think that's sort of the best thing to do. You can be involved in Zuccotti and you can go to Harlem and go march against stop and frisk, or you can go occupy a home in Minnesota, in Harlem again. Um, You can go march for the millionaire's tax. You can go demand um, on, let me see, last weekend, I was, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, um, actually on bank transfer day as well. I was down on a march to Foley Square that was against the foreclosure settlement. I mean, there are there are actions that are springing out of this that are directed at very specific political actions. Policy but, goals, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, policy goals or some sort of specific change. Right. But that doesn't have to be the goal of the whole movement, and you, it doesn't have to be yours. If you don't agree with that, you don't go on that march. And right. because the movement as a whole hasn't endorsed any of these things, you can keep coming back, even if you don't agree with everything, because you agree with most of it and you will find your things that you want to work on. That's why the working groups are great. Right. Um, there are plenty of tensions. There are plenty of questions. There are plenty of people who keep pushing these questions in, in the mainstream and even in the independent media, um, going, are these, are these things we need to deal with? Are we going to need to deal with the question of the election? Are we going to need to endorse something? Somebody was talking about, you know, starting a third party and I'm just like, just let it be. But I think in that case, I mean, I've always sort of leaned this way, but I think that policy goals are a better idea than candidates in any case. Mm -hmm. I think the point is not that you join up with the cult of personality of whoever, whether it's Michelle Bachman or Ralph Nader. Um, Right. But the idea is what what are our goals? What's going to be accomplished by doing this? What policies do we want to support? And then figure out a way to, A, find politicians who say they support those and then make them do it. Right, right. Hold them accountable for that. Um, right. Um, and so, yeah, what else, what else do you see? You know, I guess the other issue um, has been whether there's going to be 
uh, an adherence to consensus and a pure form. I, I think New York's already adopted a spokes council model and some of the working groups have adopted some kind of modified consensus. Um, and so that tends to be a bit of an issue. And then, and this might be related, maybe it's not, is, you know, how does, I, you know, you'll hear it put in terms of, you know, how does the movement scale? Mm -hmm. um, but another issue is, and, and maybe this is the exact same issue, but, you know, how does it establish kind of durable organizational roots uh, and maintain this kind of lack of structure, this horizon horizontality? So is that something, I mean, it, it's actually really fascinating because I think this movement is really working through all of those things in real time. Yeah. yeah. So it's really I interesting think, to watch. I think the the confusion of horizontal organizing with lack of structure is really interesting. It's lack of hierarchy. And right. again, I'm going to reference Chris Hayes because the show was really good this weekend. They were talking about Penn State mm -hmm. and what happened at Penn State where this very respected coach was caught raping little boys. Um, right. And then the even more respected coach covered it up. And what they were talking about was the way in which these very hierarchical institutions provide the perfect opportunity for cover-ups like that, right? right? Where you have the one guy who sees it tells the one guy who's in charge of him, and somewhere up that chain, it can just stop and go away. Right. And somebody can just make that decision to just make it go away. And you have done, in theory, what you're obligated to do by telling your immediate superior. Mm -hmm. And if your immediate superior doesn't do anything about it, then that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. And in, for instance, if you see something, because there have been sexual assaults reported in Zuccotti Park and at other occupations, if you see something happen there, there's no, there's no immediate superior you go tell. You have right. to figure out what you're going to do about it. You have to figure out how you're going to handle it. You have to figure out what the process is, who you involve, and that certainly hasn't been perfect. They certainly have not figured out the solution to that yet, but mm -hmm. it's a solution that doesn't involve hierarchy. And that's, it's tough. It's tough to maintain, to do away with that because we're used to it. That's how we operate almost everywhere. That's how we operate at our jobs. That's how we operate at school. That's how we operate in government. Um, you have those people who are above you in the hierarchy who are supposed to be the ones responsible, who are supposed to be the ones who help you. So you call your congressman if you're having a problem and you say, hey, what are you guys doing to you know, fix the mortgage crisis? What are you doing to fix the student loan crisis? And they basically say, well, I'm in the Senate, honey. We can't do anything because we're useless. Um, <laughs> right. There's, there's just that. Whereas in your ideal horizontal movement, which, of course, again, there are problems. There are plenty of problems figuring this out. We figure out how to fix it together. Mm -hmm. and right. And that's without the leader being the person who knows more than you who gets to talk down to you. Right. Um, and that's really interesting. It's hard for a lot of people to handle. It's hard for a lot of people who are used to having some institutional authority to handle. It's hard right. for the guy who's used to being the smartest guy in the room to shut up and realize that this girl over here knows as much as he does or has something to say that he's never heard of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's tough for people to handle, but it's a fascinating just alternative to what we deal with now. Yeah. To, let's figure out how to solve this together. Right. Yeah, I, it is. It is really interesting. And everybody, all of us, because we're it's so ingrained, I mean, come to it with the assumptions um, of a hierarchical structure kind of built in. And I mean, like, even the question of, like, what are your demands assumed that there were some people who were the leaders who organized this, who had some demands in mind that are now getting this group of people together. Right. When, and then it assumes that there's somebody that you're going to take those demands to who has the authority to grant or to deny them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah, those those assumptions. And you even saw, I even saw that at our occupation among the participants. Like people would come right. and say, well, tell us what this is about. Well, it's about what you want it to be about. Exactly. It's about what we want it to be about. It's exactly. I can't tell you. <laughs> We're going to decide together, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But those okay. assumptions are very deep. You, you can see if you're involved in it at all how deep 
those assumptions that we all have run. And, you know, I mean, I do it all of the time myself, too, just, you know, will catch myself kind of making assumptions about it. And, and you're right, it's not, it's not uh, disorganized. Right. It's a different form. It, in a way, it almost feels hyper-organized. If you right. ever attend a general assembly, there's almost a right. hyper-organization to it. Yeah. Um, it's, but, I, the last time I was at a general assembly, I think I tweeted that it's the moments when it's the most frustrating that I have the most respect for the process. The mm -hmm. moment when somebody was screaming over everyone at the GA, some guy, I don't know what was going on there. And they actually literally, like somebody went up to him and, and taught him how to use the people's mic. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, part of me is just like, oh, just make him go away so we can actually deal with the business at hand. Right. But that's not how this works. Right. And, you know, the commitment to going through explaining the process at the beginning of each one so that if there's even one person in the crowd who doesn't know how it works, it's been explained right. each time. And that's, you know, you get there at seven and it's cold in New York now and right. you stand outside and you want to go home, but this is important. And that's, yeah, yeah it can be annoyingly hyper-organized, but right. it's, those are the things that are important and we're learning by doing these alternative processes. Right. I see. Yeah. So where do you see the movement going? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. Huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I, it's a fascinating ride. And like I said, I was, you know, I was skeptical of it at the beginning. So I feel like I don't even get to say. I hope that it keeps growing. I hope that next year is bigger than next year uh, than this year. I hope that the how I, th I hope that the home occupations keep growing. Right. I hope that the one that I'm really really enjoying right now here, the group that I've been following for the last couple of weeks, is the Occupy the DOE, mm -hmm. the Education Activists, mm -hmm. and they and this is the this is pub New York Public Schools. This is not mm. um, higher ed, although I think it's all connected. Right. The growth of charters of privatizing our our public schools. You know, what's next? Once they're all privatized, then we slowly see fees creeping in there. I right. mean, this is how it all happened, right? Um, but they, the first thing that they did that was amazing and beautiful was they went into the panel for education policy, which is um, the mayor's appointed panel for that runs the schools. And they, they have monthly, I think, meetings where the public can come in and attend and talk to the chancellor and the people who are all appointed by our billionaire mayor um, to tell us how the schools are supposed to be run, most of whom they are not actually teachers or educators. Um, and they've just, this is sort of spectacularly failed. They've had people, one of the men I interviewed, um, who's a New York City teacher, told me that at one of these meetings they had people testifying till four in the morning, and the panel just voted against what the people wanted, because they can. Right. So right. at this last panel, they went in, and they did a mic check. And they shut it down, and they held their own panel. They held their own discussion. There were eight-year-old kids talking about their class size on the people's mic. They held the General Assembly um, a week ago, actually today, and they um, there were you know 13-year-old kids saying standardized tests are awful. They're they're and it was 13-year-old girl and you know a retired principal and teachers and parents and all of these people talking together about the problems with the schools um, and working on other ways to do this. Um, I love this trend of mic checking politicians, mm -hmm. right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody says, oh, well, you're shouting them down. You're shouting them down. Well, they're allowed to speak. They just have to speak at the same, the same way that the people are speaking. When they occupy the DOE people had their general assembly on the steps of the Department of Education, they invited Mayor Bloomberg. They invited right. Chancellor Walcott. They said, you are welcome to come and speak. You just have right. to speak to people's mic like all of us. Right. And get in the stack, not... probably. <laughs> exactly. Of course they didn't show up. But right. <laughs> of course not. They were inside the building, and, we, you know, the police were making sure there's a, you know, way down the steps so they can come out. But, you know, we didn't see him. Um, right. Right. And, and anybody could do that at any time right. because they're a person. Right. You can always show up and just throw yourself in the stack and come speak. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but don't they? Yeah, you don't want to give up your institutional authority in right. order to be just another person. Where some of us, right, think that's wonderful. Right. So. Right. Exactly. And long overdue. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing about 
the thing about the horizontality, you know, I didn't have any experience with this before this yeah. movement. Like I didn't have any previous, like a lot of people with previous activist experience had done yeah. stuff on these types of lines. I hadn't. Yeah. And the thing that really has impressed me and to no end is the the ability for people to act spontaneously and what yeah. that does in terms of kind of unleashing people's creativity. You know, like yeah. these, these type of Occupy the GOE, these types mm -hmm. of movements, you don't really have to get any permission for these types of things. I mean, you just kind of create a group and go start doing it. And if people yeah. want to join you, they can join you. And these things aren't created from above. And everybody will think that they are, but they aren't. And so anybody who wants to come in and say, I have an idea, are really encouraged to just go do that, go yeah. pursue that idea and get other people involved and get other people excited about it. And it's really spawning, I think, I see just, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of just watching it, I guess, just watching yeah. all of these yeah. things and all of this creativity of the way to handle things that have just blown me away, really. I'm really interested, like one of the things I'm really interested in is the foreclosure because, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that people are starting to work with groups that have been trying to stop foreclosures right? and yeah. trying to do those types of things because it's an issue that is nationwide. It translates yeah. to everybody. And like the issue you're working on of debt, that's nationwide. That transfers, mm -hmm. that transfers to everybody. Um, and, and, you know, they are these, and, and really intimately related, I think really, you know, the debt issues obviously really related mm -hmm. to um, the overall, um, issue. And so, I'll, but I'll be really interested to see the types of things that people are coming up with. Like I did see in Harlem, they had, you know, gone and occupied a building and got yeah. somebody's, you know, these types of things. Very interesting to me. And I think, and, and people have stopped some foreclosures, I think, in various yeah. cities. And so I'll be really interested to see where those types of things go. So, I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, I guess when you say, where does it go? It's like, it's unlimited in its potential. Exactly. It goes and, everywhere. Right, right, exactly. And it and as long as it maintains a grassroots, I mean you could you could stop pieces of it. But it's so yeah. big now and it's in so many places right now, it's almost difficult to see it being completely eradicated. So that's pretty exciting. I mean I think that the issue that you'll hear people be concerned with who are veterans, you know, like your Naomi yeah. clients, are the comparison with Seattle. Yeah. And the idea, but I think that occupation is so fundamentally different than what happened in Seattle. Seattle was a week long. It was, you know, directed at a summit. And this is the thing about that movement, right? Once again, it was still largely people, or at least the young people, the union members who were involved with things like that were certainly feeling the actual pain. But the right? young people involved in Seattle, the young people involved in the 60s, were not feeling the hurt the same way that they are now. Right. This is this is directly impacting people right now. There, there is, um, kind of get wonky for a second, but um, Mark Fisher is a, a British writer who wrote this little thin zero books book called capitalist realism and what he means by capitalist realism is the idea that there is no alternative this is it this is what we're stuck with there is no alternative well right now my friend um emily emily Manuel, she's a, a writer and the editor at global comment said it's like watching capitalist realism melt away before our eyes there is an alternative there has to be al an alternative because the system isn't working it right. is screwing over so many of us we have to make an alternative because we have no choice anymore. In Seattle, for a lot of those people, there was still a choice. Oh, for yeah. In Ohio, whose job went to, you know, to Mexico, to Korea, to wherever, they don't have a choice. And they, if you look at the unemployment numbers in counties in Ohio, it'll make you want to kill yourself. Um, it does right. to me regularly. Um, right. The, you know, the Rust Belt, the former industrial um, Midwest, it's just... You know, they know because they've been feeling this for a while. Communities right. of color have been feeling this for a really, really long time. Um, the system has been not functioning well for a really long time. Now it's it's very much breaking down for the people for whom it's supposed to work. Right. Um, you know, there were people around the edges who've been basically built out of the system for a while, but now it's breaking down for all of us, and that's... You know, it's it's important to remember 
the people who have been getting screwed right. for a long time. Right. Whether they're, you know, communities of color in the Bronx and Harlem and in Brooklyn, not far from where I live. And also um, to realize that, yeah, now we, we have to do this because there's no other choice. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, well, I think we'll end it there. Thank you so much for agreeing to meet with us, and you're doing really great work. And I will make sure to link some of your recent alternate pieces uh, for everybody. And thank you again for meeting with us. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye.